So I received permission this week from uh, Jeremy Bueller to share a story with you that uh, happened to him this last week. He was telling me this story earlier this week. He was driving down the road, I think on Highway 44 is what you said, and he, uh, he was driving along and he saw a guy was pouring down rain, as it was most of the week, and there was a guy standing out in a suit and tie, and he was trying to wave people down, trying to wave people down and, and get them to stop. And Jeremy saw him, and his first inclination was just keep going, right, as many as our, of ours would probably be. And, and he decided, he, he was sitting there, and, and something provoked him to say, you know, that just doesn't seem right. I need to turn around. So he decided instead to turn around to go see what was happening. And it turns out that there had been a blazer that had crashed straight into a tree. And there was a passerby who was trying to wave down help because there was a man trapped inside of this car and he had hit his head and there was a massive head trauma and blood was coming out of his ears and he was non-responsive and he was trapped in the car. The car was bent and uh, he was just, he was, he was trapped in there. And so Jeremy is trying to figure out, he's trying to get this other guy to help him. The other guy is locked up, doesn't know what to do. So Jeremy goes over and uh, starts to figure out how he's going to get this guy out. And the door is halfway popped open from where the, um, from where it had, you know, had been hit. And so he decides, I'm just, I'm going to have to do it. And so he grabs the edge of the door and he just starts pulling and pulling and pulling. Eventually bends the door back, trying to figure out the best way to come in. And he notices smoke starting to billow up in the front of the, in front of the hood. And the, 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 the car had been, had caught on fire. And so he knows any minute this guy is going to get consumed, completely burned alive. He's like, I have to hurry. I have to get this through. And so he decides the quickest way is to reach in through the window. Well, he reaches in through the window to get the guy underneath, the arm, under, underneath his arms, and he starts pulling the guy out. Well, the heat from the fire had crossed the wires, and the window started to roll up. And so he's, he's pushing, his, pushing the window down, trying to trap the window from rolling up on this guy. Uh, in order to, you know, to, to trap him in there for good. And then he looks down and the fire starts spreading up towards his leg and so up towards his pants, about to catch his pants on fire. And he's holding this down and then he pulls him out and then his foot get cr- gets crammed between the dashboard and the steering wheel. And so he's, it just, it keeps coming, it keeps coming that there's just these obstacles to get this guy out and to save the guy's life. So Jeremy reaches in, grabs the steering wheel with one arm, just, just rips the steering wheel off the dash. And my, as he's telling me the story, my eyes are this big, and I'm like, you're kidding me, wow, you know? And so he peels the steering wheel back and pulls him out through the window, and the EMTs show up later on and said, you saved his life, because by that time, the blazer was completely engulfed in flames, completely engulfed in flames, and there, was, uh, there would have been no rescuing that man if Jeremy hadn't stopped. And I don't say this, I know Jeremy is probably embarrassed as I'll get out. Uh, I did get permission to tell him that story. He's not trying to brag or anything like that, but... I'm sitting here, he's telling me the story, and I'm thinking, man, your nickname is Superman now. I'm, a, I'm calling Jeremy Super from now on. Every time you see Jeremy, say, hey, Superman. And so, <laughs> there you go, Jeremy. Um, he, it, I mean, it, it blew me away. I mean, the, just, and, and we know those, we've all heard those stories, right, of, of different people in these situations, a mom or, or something like that whose child is trapped, finding this power within them, finding the strength within them, that when the, duty, when the time comes, the ability just to do astounding, remarkable things, the, the strength comes from somewhere. Power amazes us. Power is astounding. The, the, the power that, that we see um, in nature, the power that we see in the ability of collective human beings working towards a common cause, power is something that astounds us. And when we left off last week, uh, Paul was challenging the church at Corinth about a certain kind of power that they were boasting in. If you guys remember correctly, he challenged the people at Corinth last week saying that, that they're boasting in these various teachers, saying, I follow Paul, I follow Apollos, I follow Peter, I follow Christ, right? And, and Paul says, I don't want anybody following me, and I don't want anybody thinking, yeah, I, I didn't come to you preaching with fancy rhetoric. I didn't come to you preaching with these lofty words or this, this really good rhetorical style that was common in the Greek world back then. I came just preaching Christ, just preaching Him crucified, because I didn't want to make the cross void of its power. I didn't want the cross, I didn't want you thinking that power came from my ability to articulate. I didn't want you thinking power came from eloquence. Power comes from the cross and nothing, else, nothing less. And that's what he continues Starting in verse 18, let's start reading together. 1 Corinthians 1.18. He picks up there and he starts to 
explain where true power comes from. For the word of the cross is foolishness to those who are perishing, but to us who are being saved, it is the power of God. For it is written, I will destroy the wisdom of the wise, and the cleverness of the clever I will set aside. From this first observation, something that might seem remarkable to us, um, if you really unpack this verse, verse 18, for the word of cross is foolishness to those who are perishing, but to us who are being saved, it is the power of God. Paul first shows where true division, the only real division that exists in this world is in this verse. It's not division based on the kind of teachers that you like. It's not division based on the kind of things that you respect. It's not division based on any social class that you're involved in. The only division that makes any difference in this world is those who are perishing and those who are being saved. Those are the only, that's only the only division that really makes any difference in this world. Those who are perishing, the word of the cross is foolishness. But to us who are being saved, it is the power of God. Just stop right there. I mean, that, that, that thought alone is, is a sermon in and of itself. The thought of, the thought of those who are currently perishing and those who are being saved. And just, I, I hope that you feel the enormity of, of being in one class versus the other. And we're going to talk through the power of the cross and the power of the gospel. But just, just the fact that there are two categories in this world that mean anything, and you're in one or you're in the other. There's no middle ground. You're either perishing or you're being saved. You're, you're either in the process of, of dying and in perishing eternally, or you're in the process of being more and more like Jesus. Being more saved, being being saved, being saved. It's a present, ongoing kind of situation. This is not something that happened to you. This is something that's happening to you continually. You are being saved if you're in Christ. This is this is powerful. And this division, this division should, uh, like I was praying through in the, in the psalm that we read this morning, it's still in us some sort of reverence, understanding. Wow, Lord, thank you so much that I'm not in this category, but I'm in this one. That I am sitting now in process of my salvation rather than the process of my condemnation. And then how the message of the cross, look at verse 18, for the word of the cross is foolishness to those who are perishing, to us who are being saved, it's the power of God. So how the, the word about the, uh, about cross, about the cross, about Jesus Christ dying for sins, about how that reaches our ears depends on which camp we lie in. If we're in the camp of those who are perishing and going towards destruction, when we hear the message of the cross, it's going to be foolishness to us. If we hear the message of the cross and we're in the process of being saved, it is the power of God. And we're going to unpack that together this morning. Let's go on. Verse 19, For it is written, I will destroy the wisdom of the wise, and the cleverness of the clever I will set aside. So then he starts to turn towards wisdom. He leaves the power conversation for just a minute. He starts to turn towards wisdom. Understanding wisdom. Look at this. He's quoting from the book of Isaiah, chapter 29, verse 14. He's saying, It is written in the Old Testament, I will destroy the wisdom of the wise, and the cleverness of the clever I will set aside. So a long time ago, God predicted that this was going to happen. He was going to show the wise of this world that their wisdom is worthless, that it's fruitless. It's not going to accomplish what they want it to accomplish. I will destroy the wisdom of the wise. I will, the cleverness of the clever I will set aside. It's insufficient. Let's go on to verse 20. Where is the wise man? Where is the scribe? Where is the debater of this age? Has, God, has not God made foolish the wisdom of the world? So he starts pulling this out. He starts to get a little interaction with the church at Corinth saying, okay, where is the wise man among you? Where are they? Where's the scribe? Where's the teacher? Where's the debater of this age? And he's saying, identify them. Identify. If, you're, if you're boasting in them, if you're relying on them, identify them for me. Where is the wise? And then he turns and he says, God has made foolish the wisdom of this world. He has. Where are they? They're not to be found. All the world's wisdom is inadequate. How is it inadequate? Verse 21 answers that question. For since in the wisdom of God, the world through its wisdom did not come to know God, God was well pleased through the foolishness of the message preached to save those who believe. Let's, divide, let's chop that sentence in half and help us, help, help us understand a little bit. Since in the wisdom of God, the world through its wisdom did not come to know God. Let's think through that together. In the wisdom of God, this is something God planned. This is in his wisdom, he did something. He said, the world through its wisdom will not come to know God. That's powerful. 
no matter what you look to, no matter what you try, if you look to science, if you look to philosophy, if you look to history, if you look to logic, if you look to literature, anything that you seek to try and find God, all the major philosophy systems, all the major thought systems in the world, all of world history, none of it is going to bring you to God. None of it. It all falls short. All of it. And that was in the wisdom of God. God said, this is the perfect plan. I'm gonna, there's going to be lots of thought systems. There's going to be lots of religions. There's going to be lots of things that people try and find God. They try and find meaning. They try and find life and hope. And all of it's going to fall short. In the wisdom of God, he set it up that way. He said, through nothing, through, through nothing except for what we're going to get to in a minute, can someone actually find God? Let's keep going. In the wisdom of God, the world through its wisdom didn't come to know God. God was well pleased through the foolishness of the message preached to save those who believe. This is also part of God's wisdom. Don't miss this. God was well pleased to save through a word, to save through a message, to save through preaching, through the foolishness of the message preached. The foolishness of the message preached. And we're going to unpack a little bit of what, why he calls it foolishness. To save those who believe. This is God's pleasure to say, I'm not going to give it in some sophisticated philosophy, some ivory tower you know, thought system. I'm not going to give it through science. I'm not going to give it. I'm going to give it through the foolishness of a preached word. I'm going to give it through, the, through a story. I'm going to present it through a story of my own son. So call on science if you want to. Call on wealth if you want to. Call on government if you want to. Call on education if you want to. But that's never going to answer your call. None of them will ever answer your call or satisfy. But if you call on Jesus Christ, if you call on Jesus Christ in Him and in His story and in His message, that alone is enough to bring us to God. Salvation. Nothing. Science, philosophy, history, logic, literature, nothing. No amount of knowledge that you have can bring you to God. It's all, it all comes up short. It's all insufficient. Verse 22. For indeed, Jews ask for signs and Greeks, Greeks search for wisdom, but we preach Christ crucified. To Jews a stumbling block and to Gentiles foolishness. The Jews are asking for signs. They're saying, show us, show us power. Show us strength. Show us something remarkable. Show us some violation of the natural order. Show us something that's powerful. The Jews are ready to see a good show. And throughout Jesus' life, they're constantly saying, show us something. Show us something powerful. We'll follow you if you make you know, bread appear out of nowhere. We'll follow you if you, you make fish appear out of nowhere. We'll follow you if you keep doing this. They wanted to see a sign. They wanted to see a good show. They wanted Jesus to ride in on a stallion and overthrow the Roman government and give the land of Israel back to its people. They're ready for a Messiah who's in charge, who's got a sword, who's ready to do damage. They're ready for a leader. And the Greeks, the Greeks are ready. They're ready for someone who's got just this, this, this wisdom and this intelligence and this intellect and this ability to communicate that far surpasses any of the philosophers of their day. They're ready for Jesus to, to overcome, you know, to make... To make Plato looked like he was in first grade, right? And Aristotle looked like he doesn't know anything. They're ready for a great teacher, a great thinker to arise who's very eloquent and articulate. They're ready for that. But if you pay attention to what the Jews and the Greeks are asking for, they're asking for themselves, aren't they? The Jews, how come Jesus can't want what we want? The Greeks, how come Jesus can't be more like us and like what we like, right? And we fall into that same category oftentimes. We're ready for a Jesus after our own making. A Jesus who's ready to... Um, be like us and to like the things we like rather than the Jesus who is, who comes in, who humbles himself even to death on, on a cross. The, the Jews think, it says, I can't, I can't believe a Messiah who comes in and dies. That's no Messiah at all. That's weak. That's weakness. The Greeks are saying, I can't believe in this. This is ridiculous. I want some wisdom. I want some eloquence. I don't want an execution. That's all the cross is, is an execution. Through an execution, through being nailed to a, a rugged piece of wood and crucified and put in a hole. You think there's power in that? There's no power in that. Now you go down to the local uh, Parthenon, you'll listen to something that's got power. Somebody who's proclaiming real wisdom and real power and real truth. But up in verse 18, you remember this, the word of the cross is foolishness to those who are perishing. 
That was true then, that's true now as well. Let me read you a quote. Some of you guys have heard of the late Christopher Hitchens. He says, If, a man, if man has been around for 100,000 years, God must have just watched the horrors of disease, death, and a struggling species for 98,000 years before he intervened. And then he determined to save the world by sending his son to a remote part of Palestine to become a grotesque human sacrifice. What a great plan. So, I mean, he is, he's got the height of sarcasm. Then he says, it's immoral to lie to children and tell them they'll die in hell if they don't believe in this sadomasochistic God who hates, hates sexuality. And if you know anything about Christopher Hitchens, he made it his life's ambition to talk about the foolishness of the cross. All the while not knowing that that's exactly what Scripture predicted he would do. It's, a, it's ironic. It is the height of irony that God humbles himself to die for his enemies. But man is too smug and inflated to believe it. Man's own bloated sense of self-worth is the very thing that keeps him blind. It's the height of irony that there is a God in the heavens who says, I'm going to die for the love of my enemies. And then God's enemies say, doesn't sound like a God to me. Can you, I mean, can you imagine the audacity that people have to answer a God who would die for his enemies, lay his life down, to bring them to himself and to lavish on them love forever and an inheritance with the son of all heaven and earth. We cross our, fold our arms and say, yeah, but that doesn't make sense. I, there's no way. We just, we, we're filled with unbelief. We, we can't believe that that would be true. I can think of a better way to do it. That's what we respond. Instead of believing the way that it's been done, we say, well, he could have done it a different way. Wow, the audacity that we find as human beings to question the living God and follow him <coughs> on our terms. Try and follow him on our terms and say, okay, God, I'll believe you and I'll follow you if, <clears throat> if you make my spouse well, if you help heal my marriage, if you um, fill my bank account, if you... You know, if God will do these various things, well, then I'll, I'll follow him and I'll believe him. When all the while he has sent his son to lay down his life and offer us eternity with him full of joy. The audacity, sometimes. Through the foolishness of the message preached, save those who believe. Let's think about, let's think about the idea of power and wisdom in the cross of Christ. What kind of power is involved in the cross of Christ? And how, is it, how does it exceed all the power of this world? Because we've seen massive manifestations of power. There have been earthquakes that have wrecked this world. There's been uh, tornadoes that we've seen just with absolute amazing power. This, there, there's been power, uh, powers of, of great thinkers and great speakers that have influenced the entire course of the world. Right? There's... There's great power that we've beheld. How is it that 2,000 years ago, a crucifixion, an execution of a criminal, supposed criminal, has any power at all? What's the power of the cross? Where's the power? Well, here's the power. The power starts with, first of all, the only man who never sinned, the only man who was perfect, right? He puts himself in a position to be stapled to a cross by a bunch of sinners, by a bunch of people who are mocking him and spitting on him, stapled himself to a cross, laid his own life down before Pilate. He tells Pilate, you're not taking my life from me. I'm laying it down of my own accord. You need to know that. I have authority to take it up again too, and I will. But he lays himself down. He's stapled up to a cross. They jam the crown of thorns into his head, right? And he's weeping in the garden, shedding drops of blood, sweating drops of blood, not because he's scared of Romans, but he's, he's scared of what's going to happen. What's really going to be brought down on him on the cross. What is it? It's hell. The eternal hell. The fire of hell that you and I would have felt. Or some of us perhaps might still feel. 
<clears throat> the fire of hell, how bad that would hurt, for as long as it would hurt, fell on Jesus Christ by the hand of his own father. The book of Isaiah says that God was pleased to crush him and put him to grief. We esteemed him stricken, smitten by God, and afflicted. Right? So this is the eternal wrath of God poured out on Jesus Christ. So he's completely broken and undone. We get to celebrate that next week through the Lord's Supper. Completely undone. But why? What's taking place there that renders so much power that has so much power. Well, what's rendered there is that your sins and my sins and the consequences of those sins, so how many sins have you committed today? Well, let's think about this. How, ma how many times have you loved the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength today? I haven't done that too much today, right? How many times uh, did, did you snap back at your wife just today or your husband, right? Or how many times just this last week have you failed to meet the full counsel of God, the full requirement of God. Lots. And each one of those sins deserved eternal hell. And then, so that compounds just on you, but then you start putting us all together, and all the time that we sinned this last week, and that's just this week, all the sin that that deserves, that's hell times all of that. The kind of punishment that was deserved, and then that was poured on Jesus Christ so that we wouldn't have to feel hell a thousand times over. We wouldn't have to feel that. We wouldn't have to experience that. And not only did he stop at that, but then Jesus, after he was buried in the tomb, he was raised from the dead three days later saying, that sin couldn't keep me down. That death couldn't keep me down. I'm God. I'm more powerful than sin and death. And I have victory. And I know victory. And I'm giving that victory to all the people that I'm dying for. So not only are they not going to face an angry God on the day of judgment, they're going to face a God that favors them and that loves them, that welcomes them in and gives them an inheritance forever. And I'm not going to stop there. I'm, in fact, I'm going to, that's just the starting point. I'm going to send my Holy Spirit then to awaken them and give them a new will to make them desire the things that are good instead of the things that are evil. So not only are they just pardoned, but they're different. They're a new creation entirely. If you know people like I know people, the human will is probably the strongest fortress that's ever existed on this planet. The human will and the stubbornness of the human will is stronger than any fortress mankind can build. And God goes directly after that. He says, that's what I'm going after. And not only does he break our will and change our will, he gets the old one out and puts a new one in. He says, that will now that resisted me, resisted my law, resisted my instructions, resisted my heart... For so long, for so many years, I'd, it's no obstacle to me. It's out of here. Here's a new will that inclines your eyes and your heart and your affections and your life towards a whole new way of living. To a whole new passion and zeal and delight for the things of God. You love the things you once hated. You hate the things that you once loved. Only God can do that. That's power. That is power to transform a human being and their will and to make them entirely a new creation. That is power. But it doesn't stop there. You want to know how powerful some execution was that happened 2,000 years ago? Well, the cross of Christ is a valve that just opens the floodgates of all of God's mercies and all of God's blessings. That's the very beginning. It opens up all of them, right? And we see it manifested throughout the entire world through hospitals and orphanages and missions and food banks and homeless shelters and schools and recovery programs and rescue ministries for slavery, for the sex slave trade. For all the things that are going on that are dark in this world, Christians are at the very front of making it better, of shining light. And it all starts back at the cross of Christ. You want to see something that's impacted history? Look at the cross 2,000 years ago. That thing split history in half. It split history in half. And since the time of the cross of Jesus Christ, the effect of the cross of Christ has permeated every nation on the planet. And somebody wants to scoff and say, that's powerless. What is, what is an execution going to do? What's the cross of Jesus Christ going to do? It's the most powerful thing that you and I can imagine. And just think about it. You can just, just pretend that you're an unbeliever for a second, just for a second, and pretend that you're hearing this, and I'm telling you, there's a story that I could tell. I could tell to a professor, to a farmer in Africa, to a soldier on the battlefield, or a single mother. 
the CEO of an industrial empire, or the janitor that cleans his office, a child, or a great and wise philosopher. I could tell it to him in the supermarket. I could tell it to him in the mountains or in the plains. I could tell it to him in a great cathedral. I could tell it to him in an office cubicle. I could tell it to him in a cotton field. I could tell it to him in a football stadium. But there is a single story it doesn't matter who you are, and it doesn't matter where you are, but when I tell it to you, and if God combines His authority and His Holy Spirit to it, it can transform you and make you into a completely different person. The mind of an unbeliever laughs and says, some story, yeah, I'd like to hear that. There's no story that can transform all these different kinds of people in all these different situations and walks of life, and I'm telling you, there is a story. There is a story of a crucified Jesus. And that's why Paul sticks there. I didn't come to you preaching any of this. I came with a crucified Christ. Crucified Messiah. I I didn't come to give you wisdom. I didn't come to give you a sign. I gave you Christ crucified. Verse 24. To those who are the called, both Jews and Greeks, Christ, the power of God and the wisdom of God. You want to see power, Jews? You want to see power? You want to see great signs? Christ crucified. You want to see wisdom? You want to see the wisdom of God, Greeks? Christ crucified. That's the power of God. That's the wisdom of God. True power and real wisdom start with with blood-stained wood and an empty tomb. True power and real wisdom start with blood-stained wood and an empty tomb. A Christ who has satisfied the righteousness and justice of God on your behalf and my behalf. What else? What else? Where else does the the cross have power? It's got our power over sin. It's got the power, according to the book of Hebrews, to give us a clean conscience. It gives us freedom from fear. It disarms the rulers and authorities. I'm going to read this to you from Colossians chapter 2. Verses 13 to 15. When you were dead in your transgressions and the uncircumcision of your flesh, he made you alive together with him, having forgiven us all our transgressions, having canceled out the certificate of death, consisting of decrees against us, which was hostile to us, and he has taken it out of the way, having nailed it to the cross. When he had disarmed the rulers and authorities, he made a public display of them, having triumphed over them, through him. Did you know that happened at the cross? Did you know that that happened at the cross? There's a, there was a certificate that had all of your transgressions written on it. Everything that you've done wrong, everything that you're going to say today that, that's, that, that, that was wrong. All the certificates. And the rulers and the authorities carry that around like a banner. What I mean by the rulers and authorities, right? The evil one. The evil one. The demons. Satan himself carries it around. He's called the accuser. And he brings it up. And he says, look what you did. Look what you said. Look at all these things. Look at how many times you've fallen short. Look at how many times you've been a bad father. Look at this, how many times you've been a bad husband or a bad wife. Look at how many times you've been dishonest. Look at how many times that you've done all these terrible things. You you just, you can't match up. You can't match up at all. Jesus took it and he nailed it to the cross. He said, it's done. The certificate, that, that doesn't count. That doesn't account. That happened at the cross. And so when the evil one comes to you today, when the evil one comes to you tonight and wants to accuse, wants to bring up these accusations against you and says, look at all the failures that you've had. You say, I'm not listening to you. Have you seen what happened at the cross? Have you seen that? It was nailed. It was nailed there and I don't bear it anymore. That doesn't belong to me. Now, it doesn't mean I'm going to stay in it. I'm certainly going to repent and keep going, but I'm not going to feel guilty for that. The the power of the cross gives me a clean conscience before God. I know I can be innocent. I know I can be blameless. There's power there. Think back to the day you were saved, if you can remember it. Go back to that day. Think about where you were. Think about who you were. Think about what you were interested in. And then think about this. On that day, before Christ captured your soul, you were one breath away from hell. You were one heartbeat away from hell. 
That is a really powerful thing to think about. To understand the mercy of God that He had for you on that day, that He had for me on that day. One breath away. And then that would have been it. No more pleasure. No more peace. No more happiness. God is there. For those who are wondering, is God in hell? Yeah, He's there. He's there, but His mercy's not. His love's not. His grace is not. His forgiveness is not. Only the side of God that demands justice and brings wrath. That's the only thing that's there. And that's the only thing you would have known of God forever. And you were one breath away from that eternity. And then God, He came and He brought you out. And He set before you a joyful and precious and glorious way that has life upon life upon life and glory upon glory upon glory from now until eternity. There's power here. There's power in the blood of Jesus Christ. Do you feel powerless? Are your problems too big for God? Is there something you're here with today that you think is just way too big? It's way too big. I've been, I've been bearing it for years, for decades even, and it's just too big. Go back to the cross and learn of its power and embrace it. Search the scriptures and find the power of the cross. Understand the power of Christ to overcome these things on your behalf. Embrace it. The problem is not with the cross or the problem is not with Christ. The problem is with you. Believing it. Embrace the power of the cross and find victory over the darkness that plagues you today. If you don't, if you don't know Jesus Christ, then you don't know power. If you have not confessed your sins to Christ and said, I need a Savior to take care of my sin, baptize me. I'm ready to die to self and be raised to new life. If you have not done that and if you have not said this, then there's power waiting for you. There's power to overcome sin. So don't be the ones who are on the way to destruction and just regard it as folly. It's foolishness. Some kid up there talking about something. I mean, he hasn't lived nearly as long as I have. He can't know. Well, I'm not saying my words. I'm, I'm reading these ones. And these ones come from somebody a lot older than you. Right? These ones come from Christ. These ones come from God. And He has declared this is wisdom and this is power for you. Embrace it. Don't refuse it. Don't be those who are unbelieving. Embrace the power of the cross for your own souls. There's a power that can save our lives for now. But we need the power that can save our souls forever. And it's only found at the cross. Let's pray together. God in heaven, thank you so much. I pray, Lord, that the word of the cross would not be foolishness to our ears, but would be the power of God and the wisdom of God for us. Pray, Lord, that we would be undone. You oppose the proud, Lord, that you give grace to the humble. So please humble us and make us willing to see the power and the beauty and the wisdom of the cross. Of a Christ who is victorious through his own death. And the promise of our own victory through our own death. Pray, Lord, that we would embrace this power and this wisdom. Soften our hearts. Make us believe today. In Christ's name, amen. There's one response for us. Belief. No matter where you are and no matter who you are, as our musicians come forward to lead us, it's time of response. There's one response. Believer, unbeliever. There's one response. Belief. Believe. Embrace the cross and its power on your behalf to deal with your sin and to deal with your ongoing temptation, to deal with your problems, to deal with your victories, to deal with your darkness, to deal with your family squabbles, to deal with anything. The cross is sufficient. There's power there. And if, you're, it's, if it's still too up in the air for you, talk to me and talk to one of the elders and, and we'll talk about what this looks like for you. You say, how does the power of the cross relate to this issue? I don't know. Well, come talk to us and we'll... We'll help you put it into practice and understand how to embrace it if you're confused.
who will help to clarify and lead you in that. So come find us afterwards. If you need the power of the cross, you've never known Jesus in the way that I've presented him this morning, then come talk to one of us overseers or talk to another believer in here, a deacon, someone who um, is obviously following Jesus Christ and trusting in him. And let us share with you the power we've come to know. Would you stand as we sing?